The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. We have entered a new era of advice with a continuing advisor migration towards smaller and boutique licensees. This new era places a premium on professional development, sustainability, and efficiency. But many smaller practices are finding these goals increasingly out of reach, as it becomes harder to access CPD in a way that is both affordable and makes efficient use of their time. The Ensemble All Licensee Professional Development Day was created to meet this challenge. Born from the thinking of the Ensemble Advisor community, it's a licensee agnostic, one-day CPD event giving you access to 10 hours of CPD accredited content from leading industry experts. You can join this event virtually or join us in Sydney for the in-studio experience. To register, head to ensemble.com forward slash ALPD. Welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Rebecca Pritchard today from Rising Tide. Thank you for joining me. We're just saying you you did another podcast yesterday, so you're you're kind of in the zone of... uh, a reporting podcast, a recording podcast. Well, they stick at the sound of my voice at the end this way. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, you're on another podcast. If anyone wants to go searching for that one too. Um, I just saying before we before we press the record, I've never actually spoken to anyone at Rising Tide. I, no, I, I see you and, and, and the other guys of uh, a lot of stuff on socials and, and, and whatnot. Um, but tell us a bit about Rising Tide, who you're working with, how you're working with them. Maybe let's start there. Yeah, no, look. Rising Tide is a fantastic business and I think a lot of people think that we're sort of quite young and dynamic, but we're going on 20 years that the business has been around, which is is quite impressive in, mm. in this market. And so it's it's gone through a few evolutions over the years and, and now is certainly a really holistic practice. Uh, the overwhelming majority of our clients are in their late 20s through to their mid 40s. Um, and we we work really holistically with a goals based approach. So we're looking at cash flow, investments, insurance, and and wealth creation through Super. But we also have a lending team in house, which is a really important part, as you would imagine, for those uh, younger clients. You know, mortgages are inevitably a part of their world, um, and so that's something that we really love, and we've worked really hard to build a, a specialist debt philosophy that sits behind. Uh, our cash flow and our wealth creation philosophy to to tackle it in a really holistic way. Hmm. What like what is this? Can you elaborate a bit more on the like on the debt philosophy? I haven't had, had anyone like people talk about. Are oh, you get a good interest rate on your mortgage and then maybe leave, leave it there? Like are you, what is? Yeah, so it, it it's really looking at the structure of the the debt and you know full disclosure, a mortgage specialist is not me. That's why <laughs> we've got someone who plays that that role, but. We are looking at actual debt structure, how it interacts with the cash flow, you know, where you would tackle things differently when it's an owner-occupier versus an investment property. Uh, we're certainly looking above and beyond rate. And so, you know, we have actually in the last six months been moving some clients to a more expensive interest rate, but to a bank that allows the the ideal structure that we want in terms of, you know, whether it's the offsets, redraws interest-only components. So it is something we've really worked really hard and debated a lot internally to find a philosophy that worked. As I said, if you think about debt as part of cash flow, but then cash flow is interacting with wealth as well to to meet all those different client scenarios as well. Mm. Is there some, like, are, are you... Are you getting into doing like debt recycling strategies and, and, and those kind of things with clients? Do you, do you get into that? That's not the focus at this point no. for, for yeah. our client bases. It sometimes can be that's where we do yeah. it, but that's definitely not where our emphasis is. It, mm. It's really around the sort of releasing cash flow to invest yep. where appropriate, but also just making the most of the, the cash that they've got available mm. or any capital they've got available. So, yeah, it's been – it's definitely um, – 
taken a fair bit of brain power, but it's been fun to actually create. And we went through a, a philosophical discussion to develop our cash flow, our wealth, and our plan B philosophies. Like I'm sure you can imagine trying to document not just your process as a, as a business, but your philosophies yeah, and yeah. why you think the way you do, and then to encourage the team to also tear it to shreds and, you know, debate it um, quite vigorously it has been, it was a long process, but a really rewarding one. Mm. And I suppose you'd, you'd kind of need that for, it's good for the people that are already there, the, the advice and the team that are already there. But then if, if you've got new people coming in and joining the business to say, look, we do things this way and this is the reason why you've, you've, you've done that extra work, uh, I would imagine it would make hiring someone and bringing them along the journey a bit easier. Well, in my guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, differentiating yourself from other advice practices, you know, 10 years ago, all you had to say was I focus on younger clients and that was a differentiator. Whereas <laughs> now, you know, fortunately, wonderfully, there's there's a lot more players in this space. So making sure that actually the way that you think is, you know, a competitive advantage as well. Yeah. Can you spend a bit of time talking about the cash flow piece in that in, 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 in your process, how you're dealing with that and how that's working with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. So cash flow, like I said, if you think about wealth plan B and cash flow as being the three uh, corners of the triangle here, and we've got a really big emphasis on cash flow being sustainable. It needs to play nicely with those other pieces. Uh, we, we like to break our clients' spending or expenses up into fixed and flexible um, and things that are more goal related. So, you know, we consider insurance premiums to be an investment as well as actual investment contributions, advice fees or investments as well. Um, and then you know, we've sort of going through this process with all of our client base. We now also have some really cool benchmarking data in terms of giving clients feedback of like, hey, you know, I know you think you can't survive without a four hundred dollar a week grocery shop, but that is actual garbage because, you know, we know if that a family of four with children in primary school actually spends on average this. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it's been it, – it's it's a juicy one. I'm sure you, you yeah. know as well, like so often financial planning comes back to talk conversations about groceries um, and making sure that day-to-day expenditure is, is sustainable. Yeah. Are Whether you're you, an individual or a family or whatever <laughs> your composition looks like. Are you are you tracking that somehow? Like a lot of in, no. in the past, people were using like zero, and then there's like my prosperity yeah. or whatever. Like, are you tracking that somehow, client by client? How are you getting the data? Yeah, interestingly, we've gone full circle on that. So historically, you know, in a previous practice as well, like we did actually track and reconcile each month. Whereas yeah. now we're we're relying on the structure itself to give the natural feedback in terms of, you know, if you've running if you're consistently running out of money, or it's gone six months and you've never bought some clothes because you're constantly dining out that. That is the natural indicator, yeah. um, and I guess it's putting a bit more uh, responsibility into the, the client's side of the equation, and and making sure that the value that we're providing as a business is not in reconciling expenses, but providing that strategic direction as well. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, you know, not that I do a whole lot in the, in the cash flow bit, but but over the years had various different iterations of it myself, like I. Clients who are trying to do zero with in the beginning, it's like, well, you've got to reconcile all of this stuff if you want me to help you with what's going on. And and where I've landed, if if there's clients that are struggling with it, where I've landed at the moment, and you may be doing a similar kind of thing, is this whole like bucket approach. It's yeah. like there's a certain amount for you know day to day spending, there's a certain amount for holidays, there's a certain amount, there's a certain amount for that. And as you're saying, if if one of the buckets is is emptying out far faster than what you thought it was, well, there's there's your problem. Uh, rather than reconciling every single cent on everything that's being spent, and um, yeah, I don't do a whole lot in that space anymore. Yeah, and historically, you know, I'm yet to find a technology provider that is perfect mm-hmm. uh, and and consistent. You know, of, you know, every day of the week, and so I think historically as well, when the technology fails or is glitchy or just doesn't meet expectations, you know. It feels like the fault would lie with the advisor and then it creates just a sense of tension between you and the client and the conversation that you ought to be having mm-hmm. is lost in lieu of having a conversation about, oh, can you refresh this feed or what was this or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just putting the emphasis, I think, in the wrong place yep. in that regard. 
And and the wealth part of that triangle, can you, you talk about your approach to the wealth side of things? Yeah, absolutely. So we're fairly investment agnostic in terms of you know property or shares. We think that they're great for different reasons, for different circumstances, or terrible for different reasons and different mm-hmm. circumstances. Uh, so primarily, we're working with clients to build wealth through um, either existing properties. You know, we're not going to necessarily recommend they go out and accumulate a portfolio. Um, and we do a lot of work with investment bonds as well yeah. as, of course, superannuation. Um, mm-hmm. And and those pieces of the, the of the puzzle tend to hit the the nail on the head more often than not, um, yeah. without needing to sort of put too much else into the mix. Yeah. Gotcha. And then the plan B that you're referring to is, is that your your version of insurance advice. That's what you're referring to. Yeah, insurance is a part of it. So yeah. we we did again work that plan B philosophy to to think quite extensively about you know cash buffer health insurance, uh, having a more proactive conversation than we had in the past about estate planning, making sure there's no crappy debts in there, having conversations with the broader family about the family tree, uh, as well as, of course, the big, you know, the cornerstone of that is is going to be your personal insurances. Uh, but this, yeah, this is a really interesting space. I think a lot of advisors will be in this bucket where, you know, estate planning gets scoped out but you can still have a really meaningful conversation about it without giving advice or you can be working more closely with an estate planning specialist to um, embed and, and ensure it gets done. So you know, something I'm really proud of in the last 12 to 24 months, the outcomes that we've had with our clients, you know, more clients have got wills than ever before because we're, we're just having better conversations with them rather than sort of shying away from it. Hmm. Often the you, know, you go to a PD day or something like that, and and they're talking about you know, how do you grow your practice? You want to try and talk to the talk to your clients' family. Like, have you? It, it sounds like you're you're maybe going a little bit deeper on that estate planning and and, and everything that surrounds it than a tri- than a typical financial advisor is. Have you seen that that's led to then introductions to maybe mum or dad or the brother or sister or like is that actually happening for you? It's, yeah, it is, and it's, I, it's funny. It's not the right word, but it's it's interesting because we also we get a lot of the introductions to the parents, and we refer them out. Like we yeah, work with parents, like that is not our wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, siblings definitely, they're they're likely to be um, in our ideal client um, hitting zone. Uh, but you know, certainly we love any time that our clients have been engaged enough to talk about with their parents and their parents are feeling inspired, but at the end of the day, we're not the people to help them. Yeah. I was going to ask, Kate, like, do you, do you have a hard cutoff somewhere? Like, how do you deal with the the age bracket that you're working with? Is there a hard cutoff somewhere? No. It is, no. You know, there's a degree of spirit and circumstances in terms of uh, how somebody identifies. And, and look, we do because I've been around for 20 years, we do have a few older clients that mm. you know, are legacy clients, but in terms of who we take on board these days, it, it is very much likely to be in that uh, mid to late 20s through to the, the mid 40s. Yeah. How do you find engaging with the mid to late 20s clients? Because I, I suspect most advice businesses would struggle engaging with someone that young. How, how, what's your experience been like? I like to take them really seriously. Yeah. I I was 23 when I started working with my advisor and and I would hate to think that you know I was viewed differently because of my age because mm. I was making a massive effort to do something really smart for my future and it was a huge investment like financially at that time and right. so so I'm imagining that these you know to, not that I have a lot of them, but I've got a couple of, you know, 23, 24 year olds. And I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. I'm stoked for you. And I love that you're trying to achieve something that is bigger, faster, grander, whatever it is than the average person. And, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely behind you. Mm. And I, I, I would imagine they would appreciate you. And I suspect you, you, you may well do like sh- just share that story now that you were 23 when you first started engaging, so you've done it. They would appreciate that. I assume they would appreciate that and then get along well with you as a result of it. 
Yeah, yeah. And look, I understand that not every advisor has the capacity to share that story <laughs> with their <laughs> with their younger clients, but it's something I'm I am very proud of. It's something that you know facilitated for me a career change. It's led to a complete um, you know, it's not difference in the way I, I think, but an enhancement in the way I think about money in all areas of my life. So uh, you know, I'm I'm enormously grateful and I think for a lot of planners as well, like, oh, my goodness, how easy would life be? All of our clients were 23 and you could get them started mm. from su- such a young age before they had terrible habits or, or big consumer debt or just, you know, you simply allowed compounding to do its thing for an extra yeah. decade. Like, my goodness, what what a different Australia we would be if everyone was doing that. So you weren't even in financial advice back then. We were, were you working in financial advice when you were 23? Uh, I was in corporate finance, actually. There is, right, okay. Uh, yes, at the start of my professional services career, and um, I was I was interested in this space. I think I had always been interested in this space, and I knew yeah. I knew enough to be like, this is something clever, but not enough to do it myself. Um, and I and I also wanted an imp- a fresh set of eyes for my situation yeah. and and that of my then boyfriend, now husband. Um, so it was it was really lovely. I mean, and to be really frank as well, going through that process was a huge part of me falling in love with this profession and then ultimately jumping the fence as well after I did some extra studies. <laughs> Big credit to whoever the financial advisor was you're working with back then. Yep. Uh, K- Karen Batsalas, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs> And so it was. It was on LinkedIn in the last in the last couple of weeks to say that you're the the newest shareholder at, at, at Rising Tide. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? How maybe that's that that's come about? As I said to you before we pressed record, there's always a lot of interest from younger people to saying, "I'm working in this business. How do I get to a point where I can own part of it?" And, and, and what does it look like? Can you maybe share a little bit about your story there? What have you comfortable sharing? Yeah, and for me. I'd been in a previous practice for about five years when um, I, I first met uh, Matt and, and Sam Jewell from Rising Tide, and you know we we got on really well socially to start with. Um, Matt, I said Matt and I had a baby, like we were going through pregnancy at the same time. Obviously, it was a slightly different experience, but um, you know him and his partner were expecting, I was expecting, and you know we we just got to know each other quite well. I made the decision I wanted to leave my former practice, and then. Matt had always said, like, if you're ever going to leave, please make sure I'm the first person that you call. Um, and and I did. And, you know, within a week, like, we were all on the same page. Right. Um, and, and to this day, I, I think it was a massive credit to that team uh, recruiting a heavily pregnant woman who um, was like, okay, thank you, um, but also be right back. I'm gonna yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to be here for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... And it was just great because, you know, they created a position for me and was like, you can start whenever you're ready um, coming back from this from this baby. Um, but it was from, from the get-go, it was certainly part of the expectation that, you know, once I'd found my feet and to a degree proved myself um, in the team um, and that the contribution I was bringing was what we all had agreed on, um, mm. that this would be um, an opportunity uh, that would exist, and uh, you know, shortly after I started, I think four months after I started at Rising Tide, I was like, "Hey guys, I'm pregnant again. Um, uh, I'll go have this baby, and then let's resume those conversations." So um, I was like, "I know this seems chaotic, but I promise I'm just trying to get it done as fast as possible, so that then we can get on with life." Um, the baby part done as fast the, as possible. Yeah, just, yeah. So my kids are 18 months apart and it's <laughs> absolute chaos for a couple of years. But, you know, it, then it's, it's, we're starting to move we're out of the trenches, I think, largely yeah. now. But, yeah, it was certainly, you know, I think if anyone's listening around uh, having those conversations with their team, uh, I, I can't recall how it came up. It was, it felt like it was always part of the conversation from the get go. And if that is not your experience, then you, know, you can bring it up um, around, you know, what what do I need to do? What are your expectations of me? What is the timeline that would make sense? Um, and you know, there's always you know practicalities whether you know. The business is creating shares. You're buying off somebody. There has to be a revolving door somewhere. It's business to business is probably going to look different. I, I think the, the 
the leadership team at Rising Tide have been really consistent and true to their word in terms of, you know, this is our expectation of you. You have met that and therefore you get this opportunity now to to at least be part of the conversation. Um, then what you do with that opportunity is is up to you in terms of buying into the business. Yeah. Um, but but certainly, you know, it's it's really exciting and it's something that has been sort of five, six years in the making. So I'm I'm thrilled that it's it's been finalized now. Yeah, good on you. Was your can, was yours buying from someone else, buying like new shares issued? Like would would what would yeah, sorry. Be you? Uh sorry, uh I, I bought um from from some of the other shareholders yep. who were reducing their shareholding. Yep. Um and and I know as well that that's a real uh, strategic decisions with them. You know, it's a it's a fantastic business for them to relinquish some of their shares is is a big deal as well. Yeah, to, yeah. You know, but they see that that trade off is well worth it to um, to bring me into the fold and to enhance that connection that they, that I have with Rising mm. Tide. Um, it's actually been really beautiful. My favourite part of the last couple of weeks since the announcement is just um, my clients actually, yeah. who, like they're stoked. They they yeah. love this. Um, they love to share in that personal success, and um, because it, you know, it's it's one of my goals. It's it's something that creates a financial opportunity for me and my family as well, and gives me yes moments as well as me being further connected to the business to create more yes moments for our clients as well. Mm, yeah, it, it's I was having a conversation with uh, with one of the younger advisors in my team and he's he just today kind of going on leave. His wife's about to give birth and he was kind of umming and ahhing about how's he going to tell his clients. I'm like, you, you've just got to send a send an email to your client saying, hey, I'm going to be off for a few weeks. My wife's giving birth to our first child. Like that, together with you know the business ownership story of you, like they're they're those kind of nuggets of gold that your clients just have to share with you all the time. They want to be involved in that. Yeah, I was listening to your podcast with Laura a couple of weeks ago when she was sharing with her clients about getting married. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so much joy in that. And, and look, particularly if you're taking time off to have your baby, it might be a good screening technique for any clients who are not thrilled about that. Like, <laughs> might want to have a think about them when they come back on, uh, when you come back from leave. Yeah, yeah, and like I guess it, I guess it's testament to the business to where you are, as you said. If if someone's someone's relinquishing some control, some ownership, some profit share that they're kind of yeah. selling to you, that that's a big step for the person that's selling. But but obviously they they kind of see you as an integral part of the business, and it's this kind of mindset of we're bigger and better together than I can be on my own, and and so we want you to be we want you to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like the, the sum is greater than the parts, or whatever that expression is. Yeah. So, where to for you? Like, do you, do you have like do you have your vision board or something? Do you have your own like things you want to tick off for yourself? Like, what's next on on the cards for you? Yeah. Well, at the moment, I'm I'm recruiting for an associate. So certainly, anybody who is listening. Um, Feel free to send me a message after this. Uh, so that that's the next part of development for me inside Rising Tide is is to develop some talent as well, mm. um, and to give me more capacity to take on new clients because you know myself and my sort of direct team are, are pretty close to the limit with in terms of just just me, mm. um, and it's a structure that's worked really well with um, our other main advisor Sam um, and his wonderful associate. Marcus, uh, I guess then in parallel to that, I'm I'm coming to the end of my masters um, in financial planning, which has oh, yeah. been, um, you know, really enjoyable the last couple of years completing, and uh, it's something that for me was a ticket to being able to teach financial planning. Is something that I'm really passionate about is developing um, and and attracting talent into this profession. Um, I think back to. The career fairs that I was doing as a, you know, as a student back in my undergraduate days, and you know, there was nobody, there was nobody there that I can recall who was selling financial planning as a mm-hmm. career. There was there was no one vocal or, or passionate, um, and so you know, I actually did financial planning as a subject at uni, and I still and I loved it, and I still fundamentally didn't even consider it as a career, and I just waltzed into. Um, you know, an accounting and professional services career, uh, and I, I, I really want to be that person in the tertiary space in the next five or ten years who can 
you know, stand up against those accounting people and say, stop taking all the good talent. Like we we want it. We want them here. We want them to know that this is an exciting and, and sexy career option. Mm. Um, you know, if you're doing commerce, you like money, you don't go into accounting or or banking. Like there's this other option that has a lot of diversity uh, and, and richness available in it. Yeah. So it, that's a really long answer to your question. No, but but I'm interested. So you're like you're doing the masters and you and you, co- you commented on teaching there. Like, are you hoping to, as part of your broadening the attractiveness of going into financial advice, are you hoping to be teaching at the universities? Is that what you is that what you think? Look, and you say like vision board, like I, this is me manifesting. I've now said it out loud to enough people and probably on a couple of podcasts now. That it's going to happen no, now. There's no way I can get out of it. <laughs> um, but certainly like that's my my vision board for my own life in, you know, I've still got little kids in, in the next couple of years. They'll both be at school though. And so I'm entering another phase of life where I feel like professionally I will have more capacity and I would really love to be, uh, whether it's in three or five years' time that I'm working perhaps even 50-50 in terms of a practising advisor role and then a teaching role because yeah. I think there's enormous value in, in having a foot in either camp mm. and then exploring. I think my, my brain's a bit itchy at times, so it's it's kind of fun to have a new challenge and um, maybe I've been watching too many um, American TV shows, but I also like the idea of being the um the professor and then poaching all the good students into my organization. <laughs> I think that's yeah, also you need quite to, attractive. I think you need to like there's been a few that I've, I've and you probably come across them in, in your travels too, that the ones that are teaching at like RMIT and Deacon and some of these unis where there where there's the course are practicing advisors, but but I kind of got the sense that they were reasonably small financial advice businesses and they were like 75, 80% teaching staff and 20% financial advisor, uh, you need to do it. Keep rising tide as a, as a reasonably big size yeah. business so you can shovel the the good yeah. talent in there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think there's there's so much work to do in, in this profession around, you know, the professional year and everyone is still collectively trying to figure out um, how that works and, you know, how we can, uh, you know, attract and develop talent. Um, but as I said, I think if you've got a couple of people who are, you know, deeply enthusiastic and possibly also quite annoyingly loud, which I probably can fit that bill quite well, is to, to, to put there. And because I think that's what I think that's what we need. And, you know, potentially as well, like unite when you don't have those big institutional players anymore who can be waving their flags. Um, you know, smaller businesses probably have to think a bit more creatively about how they attract talent yeah um and yeah i just think it's a, a really interesting space but it's a really ex- like regulatory things aside that there's there's just a lot of upside yeah mm-hmm. if we can um make sure that the talent pool is developed we we quite successfully and haven't done it for years but we quite successfully did like kind of like guest lectures so we don't know we somehow got into yeah. one of the universities where i was our hr manager at the time it was we some some of us went along and did guest lectures. And one of the courses you had to, as part of the financial planning course, they had to present, uh, they had to do a statement of advice on some case study and they'd get advisors in to be the client and present to. And so I, so I ended up doing that a couple of times and you'd kind of get to the end of it and you'd have this day of you know, half a dozen students presenting to you, but you'd write down who was the good one and then go up to the lecturer afterwards and like, please tell them to, to reach out to us. That was a good in with the universities, but you're potentially taking it a step further if you're if you're going to do some I, teaching eventually. I the last couple of years, or uh, marking, um, you know, exams and assignments, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. the students, and it it has been deeply encouraging and inspiring of uh, of seeing what people are coming up with, and uh, it's as I said, it's been something like a bit of a passion project to to pursue, but. Yeah, it's each time I come across somebody, and you know, like this person's probably only twenty, um, and like what a well-rounded, um, you know, thought process. Or you know, if they've sent through a video submission of pretending that they're talking to the client, I I think it's exciting. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you touched on just before looking to hire an associate advisor. What, what's the what's the kind of ins- internal structure that you're operating now? Like you know, from advisor and then some level of support. Like, what is that set up like? Yep. So we have a probably similar to some businesses a, a pod structure in terms yeah. of um, the individual advisor. Uh, Sam has associate a a client service representative um, or two working mm-hmm. alongside. Um, in those sort of mini business units. Mm. Um, and so you know, I, I have my wonderful CSR Lester. He's my left-hand man. You know, we're just um, constantly in communication and developing our, our client book and our, our little mini business. So mm. uh, for us, we're, uh, we're looking to go back to what say, go back to the draft and, and get someone young. Um, we're all, you know, incredibly fortunate with uh, recruiting Marcus last year, who's a mature age recruit. Uh, he's a career changer. He's coming from um, the investments world. He used to work okay. in the office. So he is absolutely a rare bird and and probably faster than ballot the team energy and experience to, to have someone more junior, um, which may be, you know, even in their first or second year of uni or um, perhaps starting to go through the, the PY um, program. So we're pretty open-minded it's really about finding the right uh the right energy the right personality um you know we're pretty big on like your disc profiling and and really really those ideal um characteristics of what we want that person in the role to to have um we're confident in our ability to train for skills but yeah it's it's an interesting process and particularly you know, you always feel like there's there's not enough hours in the week, but a valuable one to commit the time to to get the right person as well. Yeah, that you, you're you're talking about that hiring process at, at kind of a higher level than what I typically hear other people talking about, like doing the disc thing and all the rest of it. You're hiring for those those things that you can't teach someone, and mm-hmm. the bits that you can teach them, all well, that just come that just comes later. Was often find in, in a lot of the hiring process there kind of doing it the other way around. They're hiring based on the the stuff that someone's taught them and then they find out later on that they were the wrong fit because of something that they could have done through some psychotype testing. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly a slower process, but we're mm-hmm. hoping to lead to a more sustainable outcome in the end. Yeah. Now, last thing that I wanted to have a, a chat about, you're, so you're at Wealth Enhancers a while back I, no, at least to my mind, they were you know, that business and, and that you were part of was probably the first that was trying to deal with younger clients. As you, as you commented earlier, earlier in the podcast, like you know, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you said you worked with with young clients, you were you were kind of a bit of an outlier there. Like, what was the dynamic in that in that business like? It, I, from an outside looking in, as I said, I consumed the podcast and any time anything was written, I kind of consumed all of it to try and learn as much as you could from the outside. But it seemed like uh, it, it operated very differently to a traditional financial advice business. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on, on the business over the years. I, I think it actually was just before its time um, because a lot of the things that were really dynamic or like game changers back then are like really commonplace yeah. now. Um, you know, who, one of the biggest things I took out of that um, five years in, in that practice was it, it set me up really well for COVID because we're already, you know, used to working remotely and, oh, yeah. and I, uh, you know, used to having a, a footprint across Australia um, and, uh, yeah, the confidence, the process, the, you know, the method to to engage with clients digitally. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the great irony now is that those, the clients, the millennial client base, like we're, we're what, mid-30s mm-hmm. um, through to like a late 40s now, like we're not actually that, that young no. um, anymore. But, you know, I think back then certainly – uh, investing a lot in financial well-being content. You know, I love, I love one that there's so many practices that play in this space. Now, I love that I can go to an industry or a professional event, and you're not the outlier in jeans and a t-shirt if that's what you want to wear. Yeah. You know, I, I love that there is a financial well-being or sort of financial literacy content provider for whatever your style is. Like, you know, if if you like listening to Glenn James or Victoria Divine or A Sugar Mama or um, The Broke Generation, whatever is your style, like now, you know, 
five, six years ago, I felt like there was a real need to create content in this place. Whereas I love actually now step, stepping back and referring out, being like, this. There's so many great providers here, yeah. you know, depending and depending on what works for you. So, uh, yeah, the, it was a it was a fun and innovative time, and and I love that as I said, things that were really innovative back then and, and now thoroughly mainstream. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. You, you're right in that that your comment there about maybe being a, a business just before its time, whereas it it would be very commonplace for that type of business and those types of clients to be to be working with them now, but but it wasn't such back then. With the like you comment about the the millennials being you know kind of thirty forty year olds now the aging yeah millennials <laughs> do you think rising do you think rising tide will age up with the we will as that's, well that's absolutely our intention so yeah. you know we're we're not pegged to this age range it's we're we're pegged to these people and we will all age together um, yeah even for myself five years ago I had I had a real gen- genuine interest I spent so much time talking about like pregnancies and conception and, you know, the early baby days. And um, I still absolutely love to talk about that. But now also as my own life has evolved, um, I'm loving talking about school. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in in the next five or ten years, if I'm talking about menopause and, and divorces and deaths, and, you know, that is that is part of the fun of it and something that I really enjoy and has always been um, one of my main attractions to, to this as a um, you know a way to earn a living as well mm. is because like that's what I'm doing that's where I'm up to in life and I, I learn a lot of my clients mm. um, and particularly those who are like a few years ahead of me in in, in life but um, I think it also brings a, a natural passion if um, if you can be in it yourself. Yeah, I was joking. My husband, the only thing left to do is get a divorce, um, and that he better <laughs> better watch out. But um, <laughs> so on the on the top, like, yeah, I was talking to a, a got a comment about the divorce. I'll get to in a second. But the um, kind of that age bracket and, and 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 aging up. I was having a conversation with one of the younger advisors in 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 my team the other day about you kind of like in our business, you have this bread and butters like the retiree type client, but you're also particular as a younger advisor. You're going to attract clients that are a little bit older than you and a little bit younger than you, and that and as you get older, they're also going to get older too. Uh, and and it seems like you know, from what I know of the, your rising tide, you're all kind of in that age bracket mm-hmm. anyway. And so as you get older and you're experiencing different things in your life, kids getting older and primary school and high school and so forth, if you're sharing that online as you do, um, you're going to be attracting those types of clients that are going through that same journey as you. Uh, regardless of your age, there's always going to be those things they're going through. Yeah, I mean, we started today's conversation talking about advice philosophies, and it, it is also a big part of how we devise those philosophies because we, you know, are very proud of the fact that we're living these strategies ourselves, and yeah, you know, we've we've you know pushed and broken them and changed them based off our learnings. We've debated them because we have different personal preferences and. Um, you know, we we want to be working through that process constantly. Um, you know, to to make sure that what we're asking, advising, demanding of our clients is is no different to what we would have for ourselves. Mm. Yeah, the comment on the divorce part. I don't think my kids may be a little older than you. My my eldest is in grade five, but just in this last year, it's like you see the stats about how many people end up getting divorced. Like we're getting towards the end of high, the end of primary school for my for my eldest. And there's so many parents at the school like starting to get divorced. There was none of it. And it's just it's just in this last eighteen months it's starting to it's starting to go through the school. Absolutely. And it's an area like professionally that I've developed a real keen interest in. Mm. So, you know, a, a solid third of my new clients now are divorced women. Mm. So it's it's something that you know, I've been able to develop a, a real skill set and, and passion for um, in terms of, you know, I have to describe her as the pissed off woman because, you know, she is, you know, she's she's educated, she's frustrated, she feels like she's stalled. Um, she, you know, wanted to get financial advice six years ago, but her husband wasn't interested. She's now feeling really passionate that she's like, right, all the balls are in my court. I'm in charge of this. And it's it's been incredibly rewarding to just work with. It feels like there's all this is the wave of them coming. Probably yeah. they all go to school with your kids, but um, 
you know, like we, we love having that, developing that expertise as well. Um, if there's any planners out there who, who like to work with um, the, the husbands that have been divorced, please let me know. So we put someone to refer out to. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's been a fascinating area. And uh, I think some, some stats from Bernard Soul, like the demographer, it's like peak divorce age for women is 46. Mm-hmm. So, I know, you know, we, we're heading into that, that hitting yeah. zone. Yeah. Um, my husband definitely better watch out. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's it's. Look, I think it's something we're, we're certainly going to see more of. You, you commented on like divorced women, and I think like we we have a lot of um, divorced single females as as well as clients. Do, do you think there's? I just kind of have it uh, just through working. There seems to be more divorced single females reach out for financial advice than males. Do you have a sense of that? Like you commented about referring out male, like the divorced male. I can't recall the last time that I had a conversation with the divorced male. Like, there's plenty of the, the divorced female, but not the divorced male. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I literally just got my first one uh, last week or early yeah. this week. So, yeah. you know, it's it's hard to know if that is, you know, an accurate sample size or just simply the way it's worked out. Mm. Um, but but we're certainly very vocal, as I said. I um, I I want to work with those women. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think we we have a lot that we can we can offer them. But yeah, and likewise, I I would love to hear a practice who goes like, no, actually, we only want the men. <laughs> this is great. Like, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for that kind of specialization or yeah. you know, clarity in your ideal client. Rebecca, we'll maybe leave it there um, before we talk for too long. But uh, thank you for uh, for joining me on the podcast. Great to. Speak with you finally, as we said before. Finally, known you from a little distance. We've got what you share on online, but uh, good to speak with you for the first time. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on. It.